Hey everyone, it's Jonathan. Welcome back to Every Version Ever and Merry Christmas! In today's episode, we're talking about another Christmas Carol version with another actor we've seen before. This time it's Seymour Hicks, who starred in one of the silent films that Sarah and I talked about back in July. Sarah is back for this episode, which will be the last of the quote-unquote repeat episodes from last year on iHeart Movies. In this episode, Sarah and I are talking about yet another early black and white version, only this one actually has sound. In fact, this is the very first version to have sound. This is the 1935 adaptation, which is another Christmas Carol film to just be called Scrooge. Well, I guess we could start by talking about Seymour Hicks, because we've seen him before. Good old Seymour Hicks. <laughs> He was in the 1913 version that was renamed to Old Scrooge. He was apparently famous for playing this part. Yeah, like the Wikipedia said he played it thousands of times on stage. By the time he got to this one, it was probably like breathing. Maybe it encouraged improvisation or something. I don't know. One of the things that I would like to note if you watch this version is that... Okay, not only is it the first sound version correct? There may have been one earlier than this that is lost, but it was a much shorter. It wasn't a full feature. So for one that you can actually find, this is it. And it is British. As somebody who has you know, grown up watching old movies, movies from the 30s, when I heard their accent, at first I thought it was... 30s speak or 30s movie speak and then I realized there's a little something else going on in here well apparently there is a British 1930s movie speak because <laughs> it's gonna be different from what you're hearing on the streets today and it's interesting so if you are interested in the old accents and intonations this is an interesting one to check out for that and also a little bit of trivia which you already know if you listen to the last episode this version was actually in another version that i just watched oh really yes there was a version that i watched called it's christmas carol and what was she watching a little bit of this or her, her mother was watching it oh wow and it was this version it was the last version that i watched it was like this is such a weird coincidence because well, this is the next one that we're doing. I haven't watched that one, but good for them for sticking an old version of uh -huh. Scrooge. Of course, maybe there was less danger of any copyright. I don't know. But that's just interesting. Yeah. I like that little twist. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what a co weird coincidence to have this in the movie and I'm doing that one the next in the next episode. This is taking me back to Alice and their weird, you know, incorporations. Anyway, before, you know, yeah, no rabbit trail, no rabbit trail. Okay. We can rabbit trail, I don't care. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> anyway, this starts with bad street music. <laughs> we, it's kind of hard to figure out what on earth is going on with this street music. Are the players just tired and hungry and people haven't given them enough money? Or are they just setting a really pathetic tone for the beginning of the movie? Like, what is going on here? Because it goes on and on. It felt like it went on and on. You can even hear it in the background when they're in the shop. And it, it sounds terrible. So you're being forced <laughs> to listen to this terrible music while this long beginning scene is going on yeah the whole thing in the shop was very long the the bad straight music does kind of cut out like part way through that and then there's no music for a while but thankfully <laughs> <laughs> it goes on a while and then i feel like a lot of the scenes in this were really drawn out like i would say that it was over 10 minutes in the shop at the beginning and like every scene feels longer than other versions that i watch i don't know why is that kind of a is it a hangover from the days when the film was going so fast and was so jerky or i don't know i don't know or from theater 
where they're really trying to hammer home what's going on? Are they giving us time to figure it out as if nobody knew what was going on with the story after it had been around for about 80 years? I don't know. 90 a lot years? Of, more like 90 years, probably. A lot of the scenes felt like they there was a lot more dialogue in them, but there were also scenes that they just added things. Like, after he leaves the shop, I think he goes to a restaurant, but then there's also these scenes of all these rich people like going to a party and I don't know what that was supposed to be. I don't think that's I, in the book. I can't help but wonder if they were trying to contrast wealth with poverty. Well, it could have been because there was one scene in there where all these chefs were cooking and throwing scraps to all these kids outside. Yeah, so he was trying to shed a light on poverty. Maybe that was their way of trying to communicate that more in the film. Note, these fancy chefs look like they're preparing a turtle. Yeah, I didn't even notice that. Sarah pointed that out and we rewound it to look again. It was like, yeah, I think that thing that I thought was a bowl has flippers. <laughs> and they, I feel like they belabored the fact that they were ta they looked like they were tasting alcohol. And yeah. I think it was supposed to be funny, but they kind of belabored it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what whatever it was. They were tasting something, and they the guy kept going back for more tastes. So. Which my brain just had this little blip of like, wait, this was during Prohibition. It's like, wait, no, it's a British film. <laughs> <laughs> Probably nothing like that going on over there. No big deal. And even then, with a period film, they would have totally been having alcohol anyway. So, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> But that all leads to, like, this big party where, like, the mayor introduces the queen, which I'm assuming is Queen Victoria, and everybody sings God Save the Queen. And really, this all has nothing to do with the story. <laughs> Not really. It sort of sets a historical context, but if you want to feel for... Was this written in 1843? I don't remember the exact year, but that's probably close. Right. You, I mean... You don't need Queen Victoria in there. I do applaud them because the hair looked pretty period correct. And to me, that's way more important than having <laughs> Queen Victoria in there. <laughs> Sarah does appreciate a good period correct hairdo. Yes, I do. <laughs> so after this, Scrooge goes home, and you can barely see Marley in the knocker. And I think that's on purpose. I don't think it's them not having good special effects. I think it's purposely you can barely see him because you sort of barely see him later in the house too. And like Scrooge thinks he sees him and he's like poking at something hanging on the wall. It really works within the story to be like, am I seeing something or is he really there? Mm -hmm. Whereas in say the 1980s version, it was very obvious that he was there. Yeah. And then when he's, like, fully there, you don't see him at all. It's only his voice. Which I'm totally okay with them doing it that way because it still represents the ghost of him, but it leaves less room for them to mess it up. Mm -hmm. So I was fine with that. They kind of did that with more than one ghost, where they did something out of the ordinary, like we're used to seeing the ghost fully, and with Marley you didn't see him at all. And then with the next ghost, he's basically just an outline of a person, like a glowing outline. And they did his flashback story differently because, I mean, it really depends on the version, how they do that. Whereas with this one, they don't flashback to childhood. You don't have the conflict with his father. I don't feel like they really had backstory on his sister and losing his sister. Mm -hmm. The focus is basically on his greed and how he loses his fiance through his greed. Yeah. Because she can't stand the person that he's become. For all the scenes that they made really drawn out, this was like the quickest scene. Like, he, the Ghost of Christmas Past was barely there. They could have shortened other parts and added more detail in others, but they... Yeah. And another thing that they did different was, like, it was almost like he was watching TV, because the ghost was just showing him his past, like, it was like it was projected on the window, I think. Mm. It wasn't like they traveled to the past. Right. Which... 
like I said, my point of reference is the 80s one where he is literally walking in his past. Mm -hmm. I think most versions do and that. And they can't hear him or see him, but he's reliving it. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, not a big deal to me, but I mean, a little bit more backstory could have been nice, but I think the way they did it was pretty good. I feel sorry for that couple that wasn't getting a break on their loan, but... One of the things that the scene in the past does do different is it shows him what he missed. It goes and shows Belle with her husband. Which you remember, though, they had in the 80s version. I just mean, like, most versions don't do this. Really? And I don't think so. Okay, well, I think it's a good... I think it's a good add-in. Mm-hmm. Like, this is this is the way it could have been. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But I, th it was kind of weird because it there's was. so <laughs> many children. It looks like she is running an 1840s daycare. Like, it literally looks like there might be a couple of dozen children running around. Yeah. Which, okay, time to nitpick. It doesn't make sense with my understanding of the story. Because... The way the story gets portrayed, and maybe I just need to review the book, is that they had an engagement when they were very young, when they were both poor. Time passes, he changes, they're still not married, and she breaks off the engagement. It's not like she got married at 19 years old and had a ton of children. By the time she got married, I don't know if she would have had time to crank out as... Maybe I shouldn't put it that way. I don't know if she would have had time to birth all of those children portrayed in this version. Yeah, no, I don't think so. And it doesn't totally visually make sense. Whereas in the other version that portrays this, she maybe has five children. She totally had time mm -hmm. to have a brood of children, just not... Not, a giant swarm. <laughs> not a giant swarm. <laughs> and yeah, which you know, I'm I'm fine with people having a lot of children. I just don't like that she had time to have that many. They were having a party. Let's just say they were having a party, and all the neighbor kids came over. Okay, that makes more sense. Solution. But they never said that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're just left to wonder what's going on with all these kids. And it's also a scene where her husband is saying that he has seen. Mm, yeah. him and that his partner is near death so you know that it's seven years in the past and mm -hmm. so bringing back the sad but anyway that's basically all that happens with the past yeah they they, they leave out A his lot. family and his apprenticeship and mm -hmm. yeah all the things that you know that you could take into account shaping him as he is mm-hmm so then he wakes up, finds Christmas present there in the feast, and then basically the main thing that they do is watch the Cratchits. Like, they spend a lot of time at the Cratchits' house. Another thing I want people to understand when they watch this version, the Ghost of Christmas present does the whole reference to his brothers. When he says that he has over 1,800 brothers, take into account... That the birth of Christ would have been over 1,800 years before that. So it's every Christmas that he's talking about as a ghost of Christmas present. Mm -hmm. So if you hear that line and it's confusing, just now it's not. <laughs> I think I think you told me this the last time we recorded one of these last year with the 80s version. In case anybody missed that episode and you hear that line and you're like, what? I think that was, I was surprised, because I never understood that line until you explained it. Now, you know, we're in the 2000s, so it's like, huh? What? No. But at the time, yeah, over 1,800. Mm -hmm. Well, now there's over 2,000 brothers and sisters, or brothers. Did he say brothers and sisters? I don't remember. I think he just said, like, brothers, yeah. Either way, there's, a, there's now over 2,000 of them. <laughs> and they must die every year or something because they're only there for the present. I don't know. <laughs> Unless they just all accumulate and they're all hanging out somewhere in some other dimension with their creepy emaciated children under their robes. I don't know. Or I don't. I don't yeah. Anyway, if there's there's a thought for you. Don't spend too long on it. <laughs> 
<laughs> when we could start a Christmas Carol theory channel. <laughs> oh my goodness. Talking about all the theories of how the ghosts work. <laughs> yes. Yes, like me the other day wondering how you could possibly annihilate the creepy rabbit from the Czech Alice in Wonderland version. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, they're at the Cratchits. There's a lot more conversation. It was kind of interesting watching them set the Christmas pudding on fire, which was not something that Americans are familiar with. <laughs> Just know that they they use booze and they light it on fire and British people like it. <laughs> Another thing that I noticed about this scene is <laughs> you could you could tell that they they're kind of starved for entertainment because they have Tiny Tim sing them a song. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, 1840s, you're either going to play parlor games or you're going to make music. I mean, those are probably going to be the top two, aside from crafts. And you don't have a lot of light to do anything by. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I, I recently read, oh, what was it? I can't remember which culture made the joke about a candle helping you see the darkness. <laughs> so, <laughs> 1840s, you know... Tiny Tim was looking pretty good for a solo. And he sings Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and then that turns into, like, a far-off choir. And then, I don't know if this is in the book or not, but Scrooge and Present just start going around watching other people have Christmas. Like, you can see, like, silhouettes in the windows. They, like, go to a lighthouse. They go to a ship. Was that in the book? I don't know, but there was a similar scene in the version that I reviewed with Eli from the 70s, the animated version. So, I don't know if the 70s version was taking inspiration from this, or if there's a scene from the book that just never gets included in other versions. It's been some years since I read the story, and things slip through the cracks in your mind. Mm -hmm. So, it's not. I do not do an annual reading of this. <laughs> I am not that hardcore... It's a it's an interesting story. It's a very historically interesting story, and it's a moving story, but I do not feel compelled to have an annual reading. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one thing that it's just interesting that it showed up in two different versions, similar, like it wasn't exactly the same, but it was similar enough that it makes me wonder. Yeah, like, where but did it come we've, from? we've had a similar thing go on with Alice where there's this subplot between, what is it? The the Duchess and the, the Duchess and the Rabbit having, like have a thing, <laughs> and you find out well this was from was it a play version written later on yeah I so, think so and we don't we don't all that to say we don't know <laughs> <laughs> one of these days we'll get a copy of the book and look it up but right now we don't have a copy if you've just read a Christmas Carol and you know the answer please leave a comment. <laughs> At the end of all this, they visit Fred's house, and you watch them do the thing where they're telling jokes and riddles and things and laughing. Laughing at Scrooge. Yes. This one, they were particularly uproarious in their laughter at Scrooge. And it the scene ends very weirdly with Christmas present laughing with them, and there's like flames around his face, and it's kind <laughs> of creepy, and I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Which, honestly, this is one of the less creepy yeah. versions that you could watch. So the fact that they weird. kept it to that. <laughs> Whereas, oh my goodness, it's so poignant. Forgive me, I'm going to reference the 80s one. Because they end that scene while they're still playing similes. And the simile that they end on is silent as... And finally somebody guesses the grave and then they switch over to this dark, impoverished mm. place with these people struggling and it's like, oh, <laughs> it's so, it, it's so good. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. But then with all this laughter and then creepy laughter, Scrooge wakes up <laughs> and he's kind of laughing in his sleep and I don't know if it's like laughing in fear or what, but then you get another creepy thing with the shadow of the hand going across his face, which is really effective. And 
I was getting creeped out and probably looking away, but I want to give them kudos. It was just like a regular chunky man hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yes, that's creepy, but if you've seen the bony, abnormally long finger, I mean, okay. Like the Muppet version. No, I grew up with that 80s one and the hand on there. Oh, it's just like this, <laughs> which you can't see me doing, but it's like limp and the fingers are kind of hanging down and the, the pointer finger is abnormal. It looks abnormally long and it's, you know that it's like some creepy puppet thing, but <laughs> that is one of the scariest things that I've ever <laughs> seen on film. <laughs> You know, you get him and that giant crow together from that Alice version, I'd be, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, that's just nasty. But I thought they did a good job with having, this is another instance where you don't really see the ghost. He's just a shadow. But I thought it was really effective the way that they did that. I appreciated that he was still a disturbing character, but he wasn't as disturbing. Not nearly as disturbing as he could have been. Mm -hmm. It was also interesting that it wasn't like they traveled to the future. It was sort of like his shadow was a portal through which Scrooge saw the future. Which I don't know that I even grasped that while we were watching it. It was subtle, and it wasn't like something that they made a point to point out. It was just happening and i just thought that was creative like i've never seen any other version do something like that but yet he was taken to his grave yeah but for the most part like watching the people like talking about his bed clothes they that was another thing that they did differently because i'm used to that being sort of a medium long to short scene they it was had pretty long they had more people involved in it and then there was sort of this evil laughter and it just it kind of went on it, yeah. it it did get drawn out and it was meant to be disturbing which mm -hmm. i don't think i got really disturbed by it i'm maybe too familiar with the story but um yeah if you want to see a longer take on that scene don't we all <laughs> <laughs> Most of the stuff in this scene, it's stuff you've seen before, but like we said, it's a lot drawn out. The biggest difference is that you see Tiny Tim's body, like, lying on the bed in the house. Right, when he wants to see emotion connected yeah. to death. Yeah. And I don't know where the funeral industry was in the 30s, but back in the day, it's extremely plausible for them to have his body in their house if i understand correctly from mm -hmm. a historical perspective because the family was probably primarily responsible for the funeral and you could have had people over to your house to see the body and the family would have been preparing the body for burial mm -hmm. it's not like we know it today and i can't i can't speak specifically to the English culture of the times, but I'm thinking that that is what was going on. They did make his body look too neat to be real. Mm. Um, it's not the way it would have been back then. They probably would have had a cloth tied around his head to keep his jaw from hanging down. And yeah, uh, stuff like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they've just made him look very sweet and precious and perfect and and his father kisses him on the forehead which i found kind of the uh, but whatever i uh, guess <laughs> I, there will be a divided camp on who is okay with kissing a dead body and who is not okay um i won't do it <laughs> yeah i i never have i have seen it in real life um oh, really yep yeah i was at a funeral and yep okay and if the person died of a disease, please do not do that. Ugh. I, know I wasn't no, even thinking of that. I was there, just people thinking have of the been, creep factor. People have been cultural, and if you get the right culture that is not aware of how disease can spread, they can be kissing a body that has a disease. Please do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> because then you can get the disease. <laughs> oh, the rabbit trails we go on. <laughs> 
I just saved like 50 people's lives here, okay? I don't have these kind of tangents with my internet friends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> I think it makes ours more interesting. <laughs> right. No, I'm no apologies here. <laughs> but Tiny Tim did not have a disease and he was an actor. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And the future wasn't set in stone, so he didn't actually die as, as a child. That's even true. Even if he was real. That's true. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. After this, Scrooge, he's finally realizes, he's like, sees his grave. And he's, it's like he's genuinely shocked that he's dead in the future. Like, he had absolutely no idea he's really, that he's, all this stuff was about him. He's really hoping that it's not. <laughs> but if it is... He wants a chance to make it right. So then when he wakes up, it's like he's one of the crazier ones. <laughs> like yes. sometimes you'll have Scrooges that are more reserved. They're just happy that they made it through. Some are like real crazy. He was one of the crazy ones. And it should be noted that the housekeeper, in who was one of the people in the scene selling off his stuff after he had died, was there bringing him a cup of tea or something, and he gives her sort of a startled look, and then I think he feels like he needs to be benevolent <laughs> to her. Because <laughs> he, he's seen what his his deeds can do to a person. And he does win her over. He gives her like a, a big, I don't know, like a little Christmas bonus or something, a little tip, and she... Well, it's not a little tip because she was really happy. <laughs> and, of course, there's the scene with him trying to get the boy to go get the mm -hmm. turkey. And this boy is um, much snarkier than the <laughs> version that I'm used to. The other little boy is just, like, excited. And this one's, like, fooey this on one, you. This one's like a, a tween with attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. But he, he convinces him. And the scene with the butcher is different because it's like he's getting him out of bed or something yeah like the boy can't find him so he runs back to find scrooge and meanwhile scrooge is like trying to get ready but he's like dancing around and shaving with a straight razor and Don't. like i was saying while he was doing this this is a bad idea and then like i when i said that he cut himself <laughs> and there are people going old school these days reverting back to straight razors if you are spastic with joy please <laughs> Please refrain from shaving until you have control of yourself. Yeah. But thankfully it was only a little nick and then he just wandered around with a piece of paper on his nose or something. <laughs> but anyways, this is where the kid comes back and then they go to find the butcher. And he like, they're trying to get him, like find him and wake him up or something. I don't know. But he launches a snowball at the window and the, he opens the window just as the snow flies up and hits him. <laughs> Which, I, I don't think I've ever seen any other version do this, because they, they had a lot more fun with Crazy Scrooge. But then, so did Scrooge throw the snow? Yes. Ball? Okay, I had already forgotten. Yeah, but then they're like, he he's, he's yelling at him about, he wants he's wondering if the turkey is sold, and the guy yells, no, and slams the window, and a huge pile of snow lands on Scrooge, and then this, the... The tween is, like, <laughs> having a fit of laughter over this. <laughs> yeah, this is all very different than yeah, other versions we've seen. I in the book, but the audience of the 30s probably found it funny. Probably. And then I found it funny when, after all this gets sorted out, and he tells the guy to send the turkey to the crashes, he goes back home to actually get dressed, because he's in his nightgown he just put on a coat and hat over his nightgown he goes back home to get dressed and he passes his door knocker hello marley merry christmas which it should be noted <laughs> that in the 1840s if you went out in your night clothes people could literally think that you were crazy because i remember reading about mark twain i don't know if he was just going out to get his mail in his probably his robe and night clothes, but they were willing to designate that as maybe genius rather than insanity. 
They were willing to give Mark Twain a pass for wandering out in his jammies. And that was probably the 1860s or something. Or or later. It could easily have been later. It could have easily been late 1800s, maybe early 1900s. So, yeah. <laughs> well, they... it's it's far cry. It's a far cry from where we are culturally today. <laughs> I was just gonna say, what would they think if they came to the store? Because I've been working and seeing people come through the store in pajamas and slippers. I saw this the other day: an old lady in pajama pants. I was like. Really? An old lady's doing this now? <laughs> they would be absolutely horrified. Absolutely horrified. And they might think that those people were literally insane. But they would have to adjust in the first place to the way we dress now and designate what is jammies and what is not even because it's just so different. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> not again. <laughs> anyway, he, he eventually goes. He has dinner with his nephew. Turkey gets sent to the Cratchits. And I really liked the scene the next day when Cratchit comes into work and he's he's late because of Christmas the day before, and he's like trying to sneak in. And he's Scrooge is not facing him; he's facing away. He's talking angrily to him, but you can see him like holding back the laughter. And he I just, keeps getting these little gleeful looks on his face, <laughs> like he's trying to sound real mad, but he's also excited about what he's going to give to, to he's, Cratchit. He's very happy about harassing him. <laughs> teasing him. Yes. And then he finally comes clean. He's telling him he's going to give him a raise and he gives him another day off. It should be noted somewhere in here the musicians out on the streets are playing faster and much better. <laughs> yeah, like I think he gave one of them a tip. And the guy, he was like he was cranking a thing. It was probably... um. Just picture that, well, it's probably just called an organ grinder, uh, the person that is, but just picture somebody out there with the little music box where they're cranking it, and it sounds kind of like an organ, but not, anyway. Something like that. But he gives him a tip, and he starts cranking faster. So the music does get better towards the end. <laughs> and that's basically the end. There's just kind of like a little There's a postlude blip. where they go to church. And they're singing. Yeah, and they like... I don't think they go together, but they meet there, and, like, they're happy to see each other. I think there's also just difference in body language. He's probably the same Scrooge, just the way he's, like, I don't know, like, caressing Bob Cratchit's face or grabbing his arm or something. Like, if it was me and my boss was all of a sudden, (laughs) like, oh... My precious darling, I'm going to give you money and take care of you. And I would be like, get off of me, dude. Ew. Why are you touching me? But back in the day, that was probably totally like, oh, he's just being kind and fatherly. And we're just messed up these days. They (laughs) they probably didn't care as much back then. (laughs) I'm guessing. And it was probably also slight. Maybe I'm making this up, but I can't help but wonder if he was slightly hammy about it because of the theater experience and Mm. trying to communicate that emotion. Yeah, probably. That probably had something to do with it. So, he just seems kind of hammy in his affection for Bob. Mm -hmm. But it's the times, I think. (laughs) So, yeah, it ends on a happy note where he's obviously repented and it's kind of emotional for him at the church and... Things are going well. And that's basically it. That's the end of the movie. And it it takes a while to get there. Yeah. How long is that? An hour? It's over an hour. I think it was at least an hour and 15. Probably close to an hour and 20. One of the longer, older versions. Yeah. Which we've run into before. If they paced it differently, mm-hmm. it, it would be different. But they did draw different things out. So it feels kind of long. But no. I'd say... It's a pretty good version. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not going to totally throw that one on, on the ash heap. Because <laughs> I think it's a decent version. Yeah. And it's a historically interesting version. Mm-hmm. And if you just want something on in the background, say you're decorating the tree and you want some Scrooge on, <laughs> that's probably a good one. Yeah, especially for some of those long drawn out scenes. Sure. And you don't have to pay attention. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 
I think that the, if, as you're making your popcorn garland and you're talking over it, <laughs> this is a this is a good version. Okay, I guess that's probably about it. This is normally the part where I say I, you want to let my audience know where they can find you, but I don't think you have social media for people to follow you. I so. don't need you people to find me. <laughs> <laughs> I lead a quiet life with animals and trees and stuff. That's probably smart. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I could well, do that. Well, <laughs> I used to do more on the internet, and maybe someday I will under fake names. But <laughs> at the moment, this is the place to find me. Someday she'll open her Etsy store back up, and then I'll put a link to that. <laughs> oh, technically I never closed it. I just never put anything new in it. But yeah, no, this is the place to find me. And that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I guess that'll be all, so we'll see you next year. Bye. Thanks to Sarah for joining me for this episode of Every Version Ever. Next time will be our season finale, the last episode of the year. I'll be joined by Nikki from Trivial Theater, and we're going to be talking about one of the most recent versions, at least at the time of this recording, 2019's miniseries adaptation from FX and the BBC. It's always so much fun to talk with Nikki, so we'll see you next time for the season finale of Every Version Ever. Merry Christmas!